The Star Trek universe may be filled with endless unanswered mysteries. It may focus on exploring strange new worlds, seeking out new civilizations, and boldly going. But there is one question that Star Trek fans have continually asked, almost since the franchise began. Does Spock fuck? Captain Adam, Go on. Let me alone! Boldly going? More like boldly coming, if you ask me. Eh? Uh, eh? Uh? Oh boy, we're off to a strong start with this video already. But seriously, and I'm not even joking about this, the sex life of Star Trek's arguable most iconic character, Spock, has been a central discussion point throughout Trek's entire history. Whether it be in the show itself, with episodes like Amok Time's focus on Vulcan's literal biological life or death need to get it on. There's no need to be uh, embarrassed about it, Mr. Spock. It happens to the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees are not Vulcans, Captain. Or the entire movement of Kirk slash Spock gay fanfiction zines that popped up during the original show's run that literally helped spawn the modern fanfiction movement today, to the fan art of Zachary Quindo's take on the character, Spock's sexy times have been the topic of much heated debate among Trekkies. And it's a debate that continues to Vulcan rage on to this day, as the recent trailers for the upcoming Star Trek show, Strange Nude Worlds, sorry, I meant Strange New Worlds, but you know where my brain's at at this point. But the trailer for Strange New Worlds, which features a spry Ethan Peck reprising the role of Spock that he took over from Leonard Nimoy and Zachary Quinto in Star Trek Discovery Season 2, featured these moments. Perhaps we should kiss. That seems logical. Also, before we get much further, the trailer also featured this shot of Captain Pike, and I'm just... I'm sorry, I'll be okay. Actually, no I won't, but... I'll try. Yet despite the trailer only showing brief moments of Spock sharing a most logical lip-to-lip -lip contact with a Vulcan woman, it turned out to be quite controversial. They are trying so hard to let us know that Spock is heterosexual and there is no room for discussion and they had to add a kiss with a woman twice. God, I'm pissed because the trailer was good aside from the Spock heterosexual stuff. Please, please, please be a dream sequence. They didn't have to do anything about Spock's love life. All they had to do was not show him in heterosexual relationships. But damn, okay, I get it. They just want us to stop thinking he's gay. I simply will not stand for this heterosexual agenda when it comes to Spock. Dang, a lot of people upset at heterosexual Spock up in here. We even had this take. With those ugly ass sideburns, it's clear they're making Spock a heterosexual. Yeah, um, can't, can't argue with that one. Those sideburns are, uh, well, they're a choice, let's just say. But in all seriousness, people got so upset at the potential that Spock may be depicted as heterosexual in these scenes that it even got Spock trending for a while on Twitter. But because it is Twitter, there are also people on the other side of the debate, too. No, none of this is subject to yours or anybody else's interpretation, really just biases. The status of all these issues is defined in writing as far back by the creator Roddenberry as 40 plus years ago. He made definitively clear in writing statements on this and nothing has changed. I think people will have to learn that their personal interpretations don't get to supersede canon, visual evidence, or information to the contrary. I don't get to decide Paul Stemmets is straight either. I mean, Spock has never been depicted as definitively gay within Star Trek before. In fact, the girl that he's kissing in the trailer is assumed to be T'Pring, the girl Spock was arranged to be married to from the original series, episode Amok Time. So in many ways, this trailer is just them building upon pre-established lore. These were all arguments that people were saying on Twitter, but also, again, because it's Twitter, people were getting pretty vitriolic about these discussions as well. No, you're just a tit looking for somewhere to talk shit. It must suck for you knowing some of our favorites weren't gay, etc. Stop me if you heard this one, but you're messed up and have a psychosis. So why is this discussion hotter than Janeway waiting for coffee? There's coffee in that nebula. Well, let's dive into it, because I feel this conversation touches upon a lot of aspects of how people interact with media, how we seek out and look for representation, the history of sci-fi fandom's engagement with queerness, as well as how homophobia, transphobia, and more presents itself in artistic discussions and fandoms as well, as well as so much more. But more importantly, I just want more of an excuse to look at this picture of Captain Pike. Yeah. Yeah. We're all here for it. It's fine. It's okay. You can look. So let's 
start off by taking a brief look back at the history of the interpretation of Spock's sexuality and sex life. When Star Trek premiered in 1966, Leonard Nimoy Spock quickly became a sex symbol. While many, including Gene Roddenberry himself, thought fans would resonate with the more swashbuckling, womanizing Kirk, most of the fan mail was actually directed solely at Spock, with many fans resonating and vibrating with the logical Vulcan's calm, collected attitude. Because, I mean, we all have a confident man. Or Vulcanian, as it were. When did you get first interested in the fellas? Uh, S uh Spock. And yeah. what was it about him? He was so repressed, and you just wanted to, to make him scream. But right from the jump, Spock held a certain appeal to straight and bisexual women. And certainly, within the show itself, Spock showed moments of pursuing women, such as in the episode This Side of Paradise. Yes, Captain, what did you want? Where are you? I don't believe I want to tell you. Yet beyond that, some fans also saw a different type of resonance with the character. One between Spock and his captain, oh his captain, Kirk. Many started to notice a certain tension between the characters, moments that read as gay, such as this one where Kirk clearly seems disappointed that he's not getting a back rub from Spock. Take it in there, Mr. Spock. Thank you, Yelma, that's sufficient. Or this one, where they express admiration for each other. Jim, when I feel friendship for you, I'm ashamed. You've got to hear me! Is it a kinky thing? Further, people who like to ship Kirk and Spock together would also point out the fact that the moments that Spock expresses feeling towards women within the show were often done under the influence of some alien factor, such as some weird alien space pollen affecting Spock's mind in the aforementioned This Side of Paradise. Spock also repeatedly turned women down, such as denying Nurse Chapel's repeated advances. Oh, I love you. Sorry. And fans loved this reading of the characters of Kirk and Spock being gay so much that entire communities sprung up around this pairing. Fanzines featuring art or fanfiction stories of the characters in romantic situations consistently sprang up. And these communities were so enthusiastic and powerful that they even helped lead to the continued relevance and survival of the franchise, with many of the fanzine creators also helping organize the fan conventions after the show's cancellation in 1969, leading the series to be made into an animated show, then a movie leading to the franchise becoming the pillar of science fiction that it is today. Star Trek owes its existence to fan communities that kept it alive, and much of it was led by shippers of Kirk slash Spock. And by the way, I'm doing a super abbreviated history here, but if you want to know more about how slash fiction saved Star Trek, I did this whole video on it. And honestly, it's one of my favorite videos I've ever done, and also, it may possibly feature a certain Star Trek actor doing a dramatic reading of some of this slash fiction. So, I'd check it out. Yet, all of that being said, despite there being some textual evidence for this pairing between Kirk and Spock, this relationship between the characters was clearly not intended by Gene Roddenberry. Roddenberry, who I spoke about in my Sex in Star Trek Part 1 video that you should also check out because I'm really proud of it, couldn't expressly depict gay characters in the original show due to his also pushing for the show to depict racial issues, with him sadly seeing it as an either-or sort of thing given the fights that he was having with the network just to display those racial tensions, believing that if he also tried to fight for gay characters that the show would ultimately be cancelled as a result. Yet, after the show was officially cancelled in 1969, Gene Roddenberry was ready to ride the wave of popularity helped by the shipping fandom to get Star Trek remade, which eventually ultimately coalesced into Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979. Yet even after all this, he also seems still ready to deny textually that Kirk and Spock were gay. In his novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture, he included a footnote in it that seemed to deny that Kirk and Spock were gay. The human concept of friend is most nearly duplicated in Vulcan thought by the term Tahila, which can also mean brother and lover. Spock's recollection from which this chapter has drawn is that it was a most difficult moment for him since he did indeed consider Kirk to have become his brother. However, because Tahila can be used to mean lover, and since Kirk's and Spock's friendship was unusually close, this has led to some speculation over whether they had actually indeed become lovers. At our request, Admiral Kirk supplied the following comment on this subject. I was never aware of this lover's rumor, although I have been told that Spock encountered it several times. Apparently, he had always dismissed it with his characteristic lifting of his right eyebrow, which usually connoted some combination of surprise, disbelief, and or annoyance. As for myself, although I have no moral or other objections to physical love in any of its many earthly, alien, and mixed forms, I've always found my best gratification in that creature, woman. 
Also, I would dislike being thought of as so foolish that I would select a love partner who came into sexual heat only once every seven years. Many fans took this footnote as a betrayal, a denial of the way that some expressed their love of a franchise that they had worked so hard to keep alive. Essentially, it comes across as if the editor tried to appease all segments of fandom with the deliberate vague wording, but ended up appeasing no one. All in all, Kirk's dissertation has proved nothing, other than that, in 1980, Earth is not ready to rejoice in the infinite diversity of love. To make a big profit, movie heroes must still be womanizing he-men. The creator of the show was actively going out of his way to deny this reading, in a footnote, no less. It hurt. Yet, to be honest, it didn't stop anything. Because fans noticed that that footnote, while seemingly a denial from Gene Roddenberry to the fandom that Kirk and Spock were not gay, could also be read as Kirk, in universe, trying to hide the fact that he was gay with Spock from the world trying to keep it on the DL, as it were. And this isn't even to mention that the motion picture featured scenes like this. Spock, what should you have known? What should you have known? Comprehension. And so the queering of Kirk and Spock continued, despite Roddenberry's denial. And it continued to be a thriving part of Trek fandom, with it even being reignited with Chris Pine and Quinto's versions of the characters sparking the interest of a new generation of Trekkies. Believe me, a young 2000 Jesse on Tumblr very much enjoyed this era of gay shipping. So right from the start of the franchise, there's been a complex relationship of Spock being read as gay. One that cuts at many things, like the relationship between whose interpretation of the text is most important, the creator or the fans, and which creator's voices on a collaborative work matters more, considering that some writers of the original series actually did try to hint that Spock was not straight. We'll get to that more in a moment as well as how fandoms can keep shows alive, and how this relationship between creators, a work, and fans can be both adversarial and beneficial even at the same time. But also, on top of all of this, something that I haven't touched upon yet is what it means to have to look for your representation when it's not explicit. Because you see, the desire for queer representation in works is not new, not even in 1966 when Star Trek premiered. In fact, it's something that queer people up until that point have been trained to do for most of Hollywood's history. After a moral panic led by fundamentalist Christian groups, Hollywood eventually created the Hayes Code, which heavily censored LGBTQ representation. However, while explicit representation wasn't allowed, writers of movies would code characters as gay by highlighting characters with stereotypically gay mannerisms, innuendo, and hints that the character was gay in order to get these representations past censors. So many queer people would start to learn to read this coding of queer characters in order to look for and find representation in works of art. We became very, very good at reading between the lines even when a character wasn't explicitly gay. And while the Hayes Code was mostly gone by the time Star Trek aired in 1966, that censoring of explicit gay characters was still prevalent, and gay coding was still commonplace, forcing queer people to have to continually seek out their representation wherever they could, even if it wasn't actually there, or even if the writers of the show intended it. It's only recently that explicit queer representations in Hollywood have become more commonplace, and even now mostly only in TV shows and less in feature films for a myriad of other complicated reasons that I've talked about in other videos. So while Kirk slash Spock fanfiction was mainly written by straight women as a sort of softcore porn, there were also many queer people who related to Spock as gay, and that's incredibly important to recognize. It meant something to them to see themselves in such an iconic character, one who also struggled with explicit identity issues relating to his biracial status as half human and half Vulcan, something many queer folks, as well as biracial folks and many others, could identify with. Further, queer readings have become a time-honored tradition throughout all of Star Trek, not just with the character of Spock, as Trek, until recently, has almost mostly not featured explicitly queer characters outside of a few episodes here and there, with producers like Rick Berman even denying LGBTQ explicit depictions, like his turning down of gay writer David Gerald's TNG Blood and Fire script, which would have featured a gay couple, or his telling actor Andrew Robinson, who was playing the Deep Space Nine character Garrick as gay, to tone down the character. Character. Now, good day to you, Doctor. I'm so glad to have made such an 
interesting new friend today. So many fans, and even the actors themselves, have read queer relationships into characters like Bashir and Garrick, Trip and Reed, Janeway and Seven, or O'Brien and Bashir again. She always said I, I liked you more than I liked her. <sighs> That's ridiculous. Right. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe you do a bit more. What? Are you crazy? She's my wife. I love her. Of course you love her. She's your wife. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe you like me a bit more, that's all. And people like myself would even read characters like Jadzia Dax as transgender. I hope you're not holding back because I'm a woman. If it makes things any easier, think of me as a man. I've been one several times. <laughs> In many ways, queer readings and fandom interpretations like this are ways to reclaim a work of art from an author's original biases or from the issues inherent within the time period in which they were created. Queer readings, for example, reclaim Trek from Berman's issues with depicting LGBTQ people or Roddenberry's inability to explicitly depict gay characters at the time, as well as Roddenberry's own biases. It's a time-honored tradition that we even see today, such as with how many LGBTQ folks are trying to reclaim the Harry Potter franchise in fandom circles back from J.K. Rowling's explicit trans Phobia. Now, people have different feelings on if that reclamation can or even should happen. I myself am even dubious of it. But I'd also recommend this wonderful video from Barely Bitchy on that subject, who has a slightly different take on it than I do. But it is still part of the conversation about queer people reclaiming works of art for ourselves in depictions that didn't necessarily always include us. So, in large part, the anger that many people feel at Spock being possibly made explicitly heterosexual in Strange New Worlds, or at least bisexual, touches upon this exact feeling. It feels like, to many, that it might be a repetition of Roddenberry's denial of such an important history to the character, to Trek fandom specifically, and to queer people in general. I think it's no wonder that people might be upset considering that this has happened before with this exact character. Yet, there are others who argue that the creator's intent matters most. As I said, Gene Roddenberry didn't wish to depict Spock as gay, or even other characters as gay at the time. And people react angrily when characters get changed from an author's original intent. We even saw this when the writers of the movie Star Trek Beyond made the character of Sulu gay in that film, with even actor George Takai, who originated Sulu, said that he played the character as straight and would actually prefer new gay characters be added instead of changing old ones. And variations on this same exact argument and theme have been expressed around the controversy surrounding Spock possibly being heterosexual. Sexual. Load of bullocks. Themes and meanings of art are subjective. Traits of characters are canon-based what the writers and actors intended. And that's entirely valid. Writers can and should be allowed to write characters how they see fit. Though, to be fair, they should probably listen to the audience that they're catering to, but they also don't have to listen to demands upon them. Writers should be free to tell the story that they want to tell. And I think that if you're coming from the place of worrying about authorial intent, I can totally see the argument here, that you want the writers of Strange New Worlds to be able to tell the story that they want to tell. Yet, I have to question, is that the argument actually being made here? Because you see, while I do think that that argument is valid, I posted this tweet online to kind of see what exactly responses I would get to it. Kirk is bisexual, Spock is a sex-repulsed biromantic asexual, Picard is straight but questions that with Q, Data is a sex-positive asexual. These are just my interpretations, art is subjective, we don't need to place the ways we interact with art as oppositional to each other. And oh boy, these were some of the responses that I got. From a lifelong Trek fan, some very poor interpretations there. All of them. No need to impose current trendy social opinions on these fictional characters, just watch and enjoy the shows. Y'all just have to ruin everything. My god, you have issues. Jesse Earl is either an idiot or an attention whore. You're a man with insecurity issues, but that's just my interpretation, tee hee. Uh, I just love it when it turns into transphobia. It's, it's really lovely. I, I really appreciate it, especially in tweet form. As I said in my initial tweet, these were my interpretations, not dictations on how people had to read the character. Yet, people took the opportunity to number one, say that my interpretations were somehow bad, despite there being literal decades of people having these same takes, so it's not just me, as well as the fact that art is subjective, so why would my opinion somehow be better or worse than anyone else's, again, it's art, it's just my take on it. But that feeling of why people wanted to tell me that my opinions were bad kind of got towards the second point here, because so many people took this tweet as an attempt by me to say that we should eliminate all the straights in Star Trek. Where did I say that? Where did I say we should get rid of all the straights in Star Trek? 
I explicitly said in my tweet, this was my reading. It didn't have to be yours. So why were so many people ready to insult my relationship to these characters and my reading of these characters? And further, why did they see my reading of these characters as an attack on all straight characters as a whole? Well, it's because we live in a heteronormative society, which means that we live in a society which sees heterosexuality and being cisgender as natural and normal, or at least tries to make it seem as such, and that being LGBTQ in any form is strange or different or weird. Despite the truth being that it's just another normal way to be, if less common. Heteronormativity places a value judgment on queerness, that being heterosexual, being cisgender, is the right way to be, and whether you tolerate it or not, the LGBTQ is somehow less than or strange or alien. Even some people who say, I accept gay people, will still see it as something unnatural or strange or different. And as a result of this underlying feeling that we have in society, when depictions of queerness do get shown, it often makes those who have these internalized feelings of heteronormativity, even those who are queer themselves, feel defensive about it. Now, in case you're not really understanding what I'm saying, let me use a further more extreme example to point out what I mean. This article was posted the other day on a Christian website from a fan who feels distanced from current modern Star Trek shows like Star Trek Discovery. And you should read the whole article because I'll be honest, it's kind of a hoot. It it so missed the point of Star Trek, it's kind of hilarious. But I do want to use it because one of the most telling points for me in the article was this line here. Star Trek Discovery has more homosexual, bisexual, and transsexual characters than you can shake a phaser at, and they threaten to add even more. Man, I'm a Star Trek Discovery writer, see? And yeah, we're gonna put all the gays in your TV series. But seriously, jokes aside, yes, they should add an asexual character number one, though Phillips is an asexual king and I'm here for him. This prince remains dry! Yeah! Yes! Right. But more directly, it's telling that the guy who wrote this article used the word threaten to say that the show will add more gay characters. He literally states that he feels threatened that Star Trek is featuring more and more queer characters. And again, it's not as if the show is going around saying, ah, we're gonna shoot your straight characters with our queer characters. <laughs> we're trying to kill y'all with the queers. It's just the show featuring more queer characters than it typically has in the 50 years that it had prior. Queer people have not been in Star Trek explicitly, at least all that much, for most of the franchise's 50 years of existence. Most of the show was made up of straight dudes and straight women as well. So for modern Star Trek shows, and especially Star Trek Discovery, to feature a higher number of queer people is abnormal for many who have been watching the franchise for numerous decades to this point. And there are numerous Trekkies who feel threatened by this. That somehow queer folks being depicted in modern Star Trek is somehow tantamount to an attack on straight people. Despite the fact that literally three of the currently running shows feature straight white dude leads. Not to mention that before Discovery, only one Trek show didn't feature a straight man as the main captain character. Though, let's all admit we all stand Janeway. She's great until she kills Tuvix and then it becomes a little bit more complicated. I will not take Mr. Tuvix's life against his will. Very well, Doctor. Please step aside. But these Trekkies' reaction, feeling threatened at the presence of queer characters, is because heterosexuality has been made to feel so natural and normal to them, and depicting queer characters in places usually solely reserved for straight characters feels like an attack. It's not actually an attack, but it feels like one. And by the way, I'm not saying like, oh, this is only straight white men who feel threatened. I'm not placing this defensiveness just on straight people. Trans people and many marginalized people are also told to not take up as much space. That we should feel bad if we take up more presence than we have quote unquote earned. We feel like our representation needs to be doled out to us, that we should take and appreciate the little bits that we're given. We're made to feel like our being represented too much is somehow wrong. Kirk has never seen dating a man or kissing a man. I'm a transgender woman, I am completely pro-LGBTQ, and I'm completely comfortable with straight characters remaining in Star Trek. If Star Trek writers decide to change things, that's different. Fans don't get to decide canon. Yet, in truth though, Discovery is just showing queer people as we actually exist, and showing us as a normal part of the future as well. 
It's one of the things, despite some of the problems that I have with Star Trek Discovery, that I love about the show. That it shows a myriad community of LGBTQ characters instead of having there be one sole depiction of queer folks that everyone's feelings about the queer community have to rest upon. It removes the burden that many LGBTQ characters and representations in media feel by having to have the weight of the entire community placed upon them and them needing to somehow be perfect for every single member of the queer community in every single case, despite that being literally impossible for one character or one person or actor to ever do. Discovery is allowing queer people to exist in community with each other, and that's something you rarely see on big budget science fiction shows like Discovery. Even further though, being LGBTQ in any form is just normal, because humans have always been that way since humanity existed. It's just, like I said, less common. Yet so many structures in our society today, like fundamentalist Christianity, capitalism, and more, all rely on making queerness feel unnatural, feel weird. That to depict queerness as normal feels like it infringes upon someone else's rights. When really people feel uncomfortable and threatened by our presence because they now have to share space with someone that they didn't have to share it with before. On top of all of this, heteronormativity doesn't just say that LGBTQ people and things are weird or unnatural or abnormal, but somehow wrong, sexual, or perverse. Which is why you'll even see some people calling LGBTQ interpretations of media as sick or disgusting just for existing. Your interpretations are rather sickening because your observations are not about them, they are about you. Most of your stuff is all about you. Do all trans types morph into narcissists too? Leave characters the way they are, listen to George Decay, Sulu was not gay, ditto Kirk. Now, to be clear, I'm not here to insult or belittle people for feeling that way, by the way. Their feelings are valid, to an extent, and they feel this way because they don't know what actually not being represented feels like. To have to look for yourself in the cracks and the little hints in your favorite franchise, something that means so much to you. For me, Star Trek has always mattered so much to me, ever since I was a little kid. But I never got to really see myself in the show. Yes, I had characters like Jadzia Dax as a trans person, but she wasn't actually explicitly trans. So to have an LGBTQ, transgender, and non-binary character in Star Trek Discovery means so much to me. It literally causes me to weep. And I can tell you for a fact that if I had characters like Grey or Adira in Discovery who are trans and non-binary, back when I was watching Trek as a kid, it would have made me feel so less anxious, depressed, and isolated. I may have even felt more comfortable coming out sooner and it would have dramatically changed the entire course of my life. For the better. That's the power of representation. Straight folks have never really had to feel that way never had to feel like they weren't included in something. Even today, where there are more queer characters than ever in the franchise, there are still, like I said, numerous straight people. But they feel like having slightly less representation is somehow tantamount to the same thing queer folks have had to deal with with our whole lives, of being pushed out, of not being seen. But while their feelings are valid, it's not the same. Yet while their feelings are valid, what isn't valid is the insults and attacks that they do to reinforce this dichotomy because of their discomfort, because of their feelings. To attack people with stereotypes or insults or sexualizing our basic identities, to call people narcissists for simply wanting to be included, which plays into the transphobic stereotype of trans people being narcissistic, something that is and has been wielded against trans people and all LGBTQ people for a long time. All of that is inexcusable. And by the way, I've been talking about this purely within fandom spaces, but this is what happens when any type of LGBTQ representation happens anywhere. Politics and local communities, anywhere. People will often react vitriolically and homophobically and transphobically because they feel discomfort with having to now share space where they didn't have to share it before. So while we're talking about fandom here, this is not just exclusive to fandoms. Instead of analyzing where their own discomfort comes from, they instead try to dispel it by putting down the people who are just trying to express their love of something and wishing to be seen in it. They ignore how art is interpretive and subjective. I mean, there are numerous ways to read Spock, not just as gay or straight, but many people have also read him as bisexual and some have even read him as an asexual biromantic. The wonderful Aranok spoke about that interpretation in my Sex in Trek video that again, I highly recommend you check out. But to give you an example of what they talked about in that video, think about how in the episode A Mock Time, the victory of the story is that Spock didn't have to have sex. So an asexual reading of Spock does have some validity within the text of the show, even if 
that wasn't the intention of Gene Roddenberry or the interpretation of other LGBTQ people. Yet while some of these interpretations of Spock as either super sexual and homosexual or asex repulsed asexual are contradictory, they're both valid and can coexist at the same time. Because we all interact with art in different ways. One's interpretation doesn't have to invalidate someone else's. Hell, one person can appreciate all the different interpretations themselves. I love to see what I learn from reading Spock as straight, from him as gay, from him as asexual, because it illuminates different aspects of not only his character, but the messages we can take away from the art that he lives within. Yet, we often place these things as adversarial, and it's not exclusive to track. For one recent example, we saw in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, with some brands reading the titular characters as gay, and some folks, even Falcon actor Anthony Mackie himself, seemingly getting bothered by that reading. And I spoke about that in this video. But these people who are trying to dispel their discomfort will try to do so not just by insulting someone's interpretation or belittling it or trying to ignore it, but try to say it's actively wrong with appeals to authority like Gene Roddenberry's intentions. The writer didn't want it, so you're wrong for reading this thing this way. And yes, they can be correct that author's intent does matter in some respects, or at the very least can be a way that we look at and discuss a work of art. But I find it telling when people only appeal to an authorial authority when they wish to deny someone else's reading. It showcases that they're only really doing that because they wish to put down someone else's and are seeking some sort of authority to tell them that they're right, that they're okay. When, honestly, most authors, especially in media at the time that Star Trek was created, are going to probably not include straight readings because of all the reasons that I talked about earlier. And these appeals to authorial authority also ignore the facts that disagree with their interpretations, such as the fact that the author of the episode of Mock Time was gay and possibly had the intention of writing Spock as gay. Or that the actor who played Garrick, for example, played his character as gay. And that's just in collaborative mediums, but even if we ignore that and we just accept Gene Roddenberry as the sole creator of the work, which he's not, we also need to know that Gene Roddenberry would also contradict himself within his own writing all the time, like most authors do. So these appeals to authority are only typically there to try to give validity to their own feelings, rather than actually using it to engage with the intentions on a more artistic critique level. You can engage with an author's intent, but it is not the end-all be-all of how you engage with a work of art. It can be the end-all be-all of your way to interpret a work of art, that's fine, but it does not have to be the only way that people engage with art. But this does bring me back to Star Trek Strange New World, because here's the thing. Despite everything that I said, despite the fact that I personally like to read Spock as gay, I wouldn't mind Spock being made explicitly 100% straight within Strange New Worlds. As I said before, writers should be allowed to tell the stories that they want. Gene Roddenberry was allowed to write Spock any way that he wanted to, and if he wanted him straight, well, fine, that's great. The same with these Strange New World writers. They can write Spock any way that they want to, and I encourage them to do so. All they need to be concerned about is writing an interesting story, one that will hopefully resonate with us as human beings. But what I hope people don't forget is that there is a need more than ever for queer stories, even still in a franchise like Star Trek, which has been so welcoming to queer representation in recent years. While there will always be straight characters within these works, with things like LGBTU rights constantly under attack today, and things like Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill trying to deny discussions and awareness of LGBTQ issues, seeing these queer characters explicitly in fiction is so, so important. The denial of access to see ourselves represented, to know that we can exist and be happy, to even knowing being LGBTQ is even a thing that you can be, is core to avoiding a lot of the depression, self-hatred, and self-harm that we see in the queer community. And even then, when most explicit depictions up until recently have shown queer people as either victims or usually dying, it makes more inscrutable, interpretable LGBTQ readings of characters like Spock, who gets to live a full, happy, and successful life, even more resonant and important to queer people. It's not just that queer readings are fun or allowed us to see ourselves when we couldn't explicitly see ourselves in media, it was also that they allowed us to see ourselves thriving without stigma or trauma stemming from our queerness. And that's why positive, explicit queer representation is important today. But that representation doesn't need to be Spock. It can be other characters in Strange New Worlds too, or in other aspects of the Star Trek franchise. 
but Spock does have an important history in queer fandoms that makes him ripe for that interpretation and also means that he's important to queer people. We have already gotten a supposedly explicitly straight Spock and a new version that makes him explicitly queer would not take that away either. Yes, we can read Spock as all being the same character across the timeline of Discovery into Star Trek the original series all the way through the movies and things like that, but we can also understand that these are different versions of characters made by different writers at different times played by different actors as well. And so different variations on the character, even if we do see him as a continuous version of the character, is understandable. I also wonder if going out of your way to make the character of Spock explicitly straight would be less interesting overall. But maybe not, I'll have to see the story. Maybe making him explicitly straight will be incredibly interesting, I don't know. And by the way, we've been making the assumption that Strange New Worlds will make Spock explicitly straight. He may not even be straight, even if he does kiss to Pring within the show. Spock has kissed girls before in the series and that didn't necessarily mean that he had to be straight. And having stressed sex dreams about your arranged marriage is a thing that even gay people can do. In fact, one would think that gay people would have even more sex stress dreams in that situation. But even if Spock goes around yelling, I'm straight, in the loudest voice he can, it wouldn't diminish the prior interpretations of the characters. Nor will it diminish, by the way, straight ones if he turns out to be gay or something else. We all interact with art in different ways and we all interpret it in different ways and that's all okay. And it's also totally okay too if you only view a work of art through the lens of authorial intent or what is explicitly canon. The only time that something is wrong is when you tell people that they're wrong, sick, or perverse for simply trying to find themselves in a story or being explicitly included in their favorite franchise. Also, anybody who thinks that I hate straight white dudes in Star Trek must have missed me simping really hard for Captain Pike, because, dear God, this shot, I'm still not over it. Hi. Sorry to interrupt. All right, I gotta make this quick because my camera battery is almost dead, but thank you so much for watching this. I was not intending to do this video, but I just feel like I had to talk about this because it was something that was touching on so many ideas and themes that I discussed throughout my work. And speaking of which, if you liked this video and like discussions like this about LGBTQ and social and political issues through nerddoms and geekdoms, don't forget to subscribe to this channel because that's what I do here on this channel, mainly about Star Trek, but also about a lot of other geekdoms and nerddoms as well. Speaking of which, I am also going to be doing my Sex in Star Trek Part 2 video very, very soon. It's gonna be three hours long. I am very excited about it. It's going to be one of the best things I think that I have personally made. So please stick around for all of that. But if you would like to support me doing what I do, if you like what I do here, I am uh, supported and I pay all my bills and, you know, I'm able to eat through the people that support me over on Patreon. You get yourself your name and videos and cool perks. But again, it really does mean a lot to me and does help me out. I am also on Nebula where you can find me and other educationally style YouTubers. I don't know what educationally is, but you can find me over on Nebula. And also, I have a secondary channel called Jesse Gender After Dark where I do my news reviews and reaction content, so check out that link below. And I have a podcast called Jumpgate where I do a rewatch of one of my favorite science fiction series, Babylon 5, with a friend of mine, Vera Wilde, who has never seen the show. So that's a lot of fun as well. But beyond all of that, thank you so much. I made it before my camera battery died, and I will say I love you all and hope that you, as always, live long and prosper, my friends. Okay, so last month, I'll admit, I misspoke and said an extra special spanking instead of an extra special thank you for all of my patrons, but a lot of you resonated with, with the spanking, so uh, I'm giving all of you who wish it an extra special spanking for supporting me over on Patreon. I love you and appreciate you all. Uh, thank you for letting me do this and for letting me do what I do. So here is your spanking, you weird, weird dorks who I love. Morgan the Pirate Queen, a man chooses, a slave obeys, Blue, Joe Herman Holt, Elizabeth Ty TV, Moran Janelle, Catherine Lambath, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki Yo, Lily Gray, Stephen Kleinart, Ali Gobert, Jem Shin, Super Desi, Mary Mello, Matt Chung, Randy Thompson, Jordan Long, East the Mad, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, D. Kesseray, G Man 42, Vincent Ellington, Chloe Dollar, Felicia Toast, Sylvester Rotout, Joseph Dewey, James Crivdet, Elizabeth Christensen, Barbara Ruski, Alex Miller, Dominic Noble, Jennifer Fuss, Zone One Librarian, 
Jessica Wright, Andy with an I, Nathaniel Fraughton, Sonia Naropardo, Peter Launders Farangato, Transit Toronto, Wendy Zabizzle, Shasha M, Leotha Boyd, Shield Maiden, 4444, Piston Twisted Garage, Huh, Steven Richardson, John Weatherby, Melinda Walters, W. Andy E. D. Kevin Freitag, Du Bosch, Yulis the Pagan, Beatrix Pruvis, Alex Owen, Tiffany Danger, Casual Observer, Maggie the Goblin, Lisa, Flynn, Jedi, Indiana Jones, Aja Stodd, William Stewart, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Julie Mason, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Lamoro, Blueberry Hill, Jess Johnson, Eva Caniva, Melody Ann Winters, Good Justine, Sarah Bystam, Sky Skinner, Jason Not, Troy Stahl, Kaylee Sis, Nathan Steele, Heoresis Maeve, Verdox Kai, Luna T, Celestial Dawn, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Laura Demero, Crip Fax, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, East Indra, Strawberry Pup Tart, Cyber Quaker, Sean Piper, Michael Goaty, Jenny Marvel, Lija M, Burr. Bella Lugosi, Corian Vale, honking in. I love you all, and I give you all the extra special spanking if you want it. If you don't want the spanking, I just give you my thanks for all that you do for me. Mwah.